Greetings! I, Tantus Naravan Jacobin, your lord and emperor here at the Jacobin Empire, and welcome one and all. Are you ready to dive into the world of darkness once more? I hope you are, because I love when we dive deep in. So we are heading once again to Mage, the Ascension, and the Technocracy. So I hope you're ready for today, whether you choose you're joining me live on Twitch or joining me later on on YouTube. For you people on YouTube, I do ask you to please continue to appease the dark algorithms of, Al of YouTube and ring the bell, like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment. Have you dealt or played the Syndicate now? Because it's an interesting thing that, more than likely, most people playing Mage are probably going to deal with members of the Syndicate, rather than play them. But it is a possibility, and we'll dive into that. First off, sources. I do like to talk about books that you can kind of check out, and certainly speaking, there's a bunch of them that you can kind of look into. And of course, the Guide to the Technocracy is a great place to start. You know, it's the general guide to the entire technocracy. This is from an older edition, uh, I think it was then the Convention Book of Syndicate is a good book, along with the Technocracy Syndicate book, which are just basically different editions of the same book. Um, some things are changed between them, so either or will give you a very good appeal on playing a Syndicate and some basic information on it. I'm not going to get as much into the playing a Syndicate character or, or examples of Syndicate members today. We're getting into the basics of what it means to play. So, And then the Laws of Ascension Companion deals with the um, Four Minds Eye Theater, the Syndicate of Greece, so some of the information that we're going to talk about does come from here. And this is the Syndicate's logo. So who are they? Well, they're a convention of the technocracy. That's the easy thing to say. A member and a branch of them. They are also the most reviled of all the conventions from both other members of the, of the technocracy and from mages and people that know about them. Why is this? They deal with money and trade, especially among the masses, but particularly financing for the technocracy. It does mean they are left in a very unpopular position, generally speaking, being the money people, because any kind of perceived shortcomings, they're blamed for. But the syndicate accepts this because they realize they are effectively the glue which keeps the union together. The union is based around technology and research, and that requires a lot of money and funding, and therefore, yes, they, they're the money people. And the technocracy basically wouldn't function without them earning the cash and throwing it in there. Now, if we're going to talk about their primary focus on spheres, it's entropy and prime. So we'll note that. So yeah. What is their pattern? Their ethos? Well, it's a pretty simple one, really. Money makes the world go round. That's it. It's all about the bottom line. But the bottom line isn't your average bottom line, as you would put it in most business situations. The bottom line is, to the syndicate, that the masses want a consensual reality where they have a say in what goes on. Masses want a say. They understand this. The UD gave the masses exactly what they asked for, and the syndicate continues to do it to death. Traditionalist propaganda aside, basically, the common man does not want to fight for the awakening. Uh, the masses want something simple, they want to live. And the syndicate sells masses is control, a stable system which they can pursue their goals without fear. They can find their niche, they can work, they can raise families, contribute to full and complete uh, worth uh, to their fellow men and women. And this control is about trust. Trust in government, corporations, banks, as in also to themselves. They have to brace their creativity. And basically this is what the syndicate does selling it for them. Selling them all this kind of stuff. Because the syndicate does believe in humanity. Interestingly enough. They see the absolute value and worth of every human being on the planet. Everyone has a place in their bottom line. Every CAO needs a board, every manager needs a team. While they don't believe that there is enlightenment for everybody, that's an important note, the syndicate does aim to be the shepherds of progress and prosperity all the same. 
So it's sort of like, well, only certain people can really become enlightened, but, you know, we're going to make sure everybody's taken care of. So they create a, central where, a system where anybody has the potential to succeed, where anyone can look at their bank account, their home, their car, and say they earn something with their labor. Yes, they are very interesting place in their kind of pattern, where they are definitely, in a way, what you would call capitalists, but they are controlled capitalists because they do believe in some very socialistic ideas related to capitalism. So it's this kind of interesting idea for the syndicate. You know, yeah, everybody has their place in anything, but we want to make sure everybody has the opportunity that they can pro uh, prosper under us. Maybe they can reach enlightenment. It doesn't mean they don't have necessarily have to, but at least everybody can prosper if they are going with what we want. So it's all about that control. When we lose that, it's just a little bit of a... Not something they're really looking for. So, where do they come from? What's their history? Well, we have to talk about before this... But this is the symbol of their first version, the Crass Masons. Before the Crass Masons, though, they do trace their history to the builders and architects of ancient Rome called the Brotherhood of Rule. Members believed that labor itself was sacred, the act of making something useful and uh, precious from raw materials. It, you know, the crap of making something useful and precious from raw materials was a divine gift, and the knowledge of craft is worth protecting. Sorry, the sentence there was a little bad. This group was one of the first of the built builders' associations to help construct much of the infrastructure of the Roman Empire. And as the Empire collapses, its members were forced to disperse and go into hiding in Europe to avoid persecution from more mystical natives. Then we get to the Crass Masons. In 1990, uh, in, I'm sorry, 997, Wolfgang von Reinsmann, who was a last, one of the last surviving members of the Brotherhood of Rule, invited like mine did men of science and crafts to discuss uniting against the mages that were keeping the masses in the dark ages of fear and ignorance. This was the gathering of the square, and it marked birth for the craftsmen. Over the next two uh, centuries, they combined the use of merchant guilds and merchant mercenary armies under the craftsmen to help overthrow the feudal system, freeing mortals to work for a living rather than service as oppressive, and often their supernatural lords. Basically, uh, mages were pretty bad during the Dark Ages, drew to the thing of creating the technocracy, who went all in the opposite direction, and so they, you know, mages made a, a problem of their own by being a little too much of an asshole during the uh, Dark Ages. The way to think about this. Anyway, for retaliation, a, bland, a band was placed on the existence of merchant guilds, under the pre pretense of the secrecy was used to hide infernalist practices, uh, a prominent crass mason named Stefan Trevine attributed this to the mages of Mistridge and got a large army to lay siege to the sanctuary in 1210. Fall of Mistridge marked a new era in Europe where crass masons could go work in open, and the influence of mystical mages fell into sharp decline. At the same time, proto-syndicate agents were hard at work improving the economies of other parts of the world. Islamic capitalism flourished in the Middle East until the Mongols invaded in uh, 1258. In Bengal, agrarian economy flourished in the Pala Empire. In 1299, the Turkish tribes were united what become a cosmopolitan and wealthy Ottoman Empire. The ancestors of the syndicate were hard at work in all these places. This were our kind of first big thing of uh, and I'll be high back to alert. Um, now we switch over to the High Guild. So the Crass Masons evolve into the High Guild. We are reaching, but we haven't gotten to the Syndicate yet. We're on our steps towards it. So they had some success, they rise to prominence, but Crass Masons would have political, uh, philosophical divide. All right, tractor. When the majority of people did not seize opportunities given to them to take control of their own destinies, basically the thing that they were trying to give people, many craftsmen came to the conclusion that most people just wanted to live comfortably rather than pursue excellence 
or contributions to their co communities. It's a thing that does exist, you know. You give people opportunities, doesn't mean they'll take it. Then we had the Convention of the White Power in 1325 and saw the formation of the Order of Reason, but also the splintering of the Crass Nations into two conventions. Those who still believed in the masses, led by Treveline, uh, retaining the name of Crass Masons, and those who thought it was a waste to try to help those who did not help themselves, such as Von Reisman, who formed the new High Guild. For the next several centuries, the Crass Masons and the High Guild worked together in many projects, but the former gradually declined while the latter gained greater and greater power. The grand financiers funded exploration voyages, the founded colonies around the world, ran the merchant houses, and became the center of Europe's economy, and despite support from the other conventions within the Order of Reasons, uh, provide support to the other conventions. Finally, when the Crass Masons decide to support a socialist uprising called the Diggers, the Guild rallied the rest of the Order against them, and by 1670, the Crass Masons were eliminated. And they were exterminated. So, yeah. Crass Masons are gone. The Order of Reason destroyed one of their own. So, now, we look to Sinti. Because, in 1851, the Order of Reason reorganized itself and became the Technocratic Union, what we know today. The High Guild were rechristened as the Invisible Exquencher. This lasted until the later years of the 19th century, when the Union overhauled itself again, and the Exquenchers became the Syndicate. It's basically just another name for the Syndicate, the Invisible Exquencher. It has its own symbol. I'm not showing it here, but, you know, it does have its own symbol. Anyway, so now that there's a syndicate, there is some thereafter debate and dissent about the role the syndicate had caused in the schisms of members of its leadership who were already heavily invested in the economies of Europe spewing amongst themselves. Yeah, so the syndicate had been in a weird spot. They caused some infighting, and it persisted throughout World War I and eventually provoked the Great Depression. The Syndicate learned a lesson from this, that the global economy has become too large and complex to be toyed with, and that the adjustments would need to be subtle lest they provoke a market correction. So basically, they had been kind of like the manipulators of the global economy and stuff like that until World War I and the Great Depression, and finding out that their manipulations were easily go too far. It was like, ah, oh, crap. We have to kick them mostly hands off and kind of like push things and stuff here and there. They removed the remaining stores of cash invested in the economies throughout Europe, only to see them blow up again in World War II. Hey! When the Cold War ended, uh, the syndicate was overjoyed. In 1999, they introduced Euro in an effort to stabilize the shattered European economy and gain some semblance of control over those fractious countries. Various financial crises, however, led this plan to backfire, and now the European project was spying on the control uh, of syndicate agents. So basically, they continue to try to manipulate Europe over and over again, and it does not go well. When the dimensional anomaly severed contact with control, it was the syndicate who managed to keep the technocracy together, spending their fundings to save their fellow conventions. So these modern knights also saw many collapses, uh, the collapse of many hyper-economy experiments of the syndicate and further financial crisis as a result, this earning them considerable blame from the New World Order. Other more successful experiments include the MMORPG economy, a new approach to the introduction of hyper-technology, which includes funding several speaker scientists to construct devices, following technocrat blueprints, and the use of social media as an advertising platform. So yes. They're in social media, they're doing stuff now. A lot of their stuff has kind of fallen apart, especially with, you know, cutting off control and the dimensional anomaly. So the syndicate has kept the tech, was a big thing that kept the technocracy together in this pretty dire part. And a lot of their plans have fallen apart, but they're still trying to do their thing of manipulating the economies, earning money, and going about their pattern. Pause for a second. That coming back to that tractor. Make a drink. Walk up. Okay. 
Griffin. Of course, as I'm, you know, recording, coming through some kind of echo stuff. How are they organized? There are some methodologies that we can talk about too, and some companies, but we can talk about their general organization. If you are an agent of the syndicate, you begin your existence as an associate. You really have an idea of the sheer vastness of the technocracy and only interact with syndicate members in their, as their mundane employees. So yes, the basic role is mostly associates or mundane employees who just do their basic jobs of working it, not realizing they're part of the vast technocracy. Oh, we're doing some stuff involving investment. An associate's most important job is networking. If not already well positioned, the syndicate will take care of installing them in a lucrative, influential position to observe them for leadership qualities. Next up the ladder are managers, who operate their own constructs or supervise other associates or both. Constructs, of course, being uh, just as a note, uh, devices and stuff that uh, they use. Magical place of power. Anyway, Syndicate gives its people a good deal of freedom. So there's a vast array of different positions under the title of manager, and quite a lot of jockeying for position within that tier. So it's sort of like, there is that managerial level, but there's also some positions under manager who are not quite associates, but there's also positions within managerial, and yeah, a good manager can remain in that position and enjoy its considerable perks for the rest of their lives. A great manager may be tapped by a VPO and become a chair. With a staff of managers and their associates, a chair is installed in a large corporate or criminal network. Their first job is to maintain what already exists, preserving the syndicate's infrastructure, power, and influence. This earns chairs' reputation under their underlings as conservative thinkers or stuck in the yesterday's modes of thought, although that impression is not always deserved. So it's sort of like, they have to maintain that level. That's the job. But it doesn't mean that they're going to be stuck in their ways, it just appears that way because it's sort of like you have to, when you make those decisions for change, it has to not influence, destroy the power, infrastructure, influence you already have. So it's sort of like catch-22 in that one for your job. And at the top of the syndicate is the board, made up of seven vice presidents of operations, VBOs. The VBOs used to be associated with regions, but since the reorganization and the loud noise outside <laughs> of a uh, little bit of a digging machine doing I have no what at this time in the afternoon. And give me a second. I'm going to close my window. There. Before my bubble. Ah. That should be a little less loud. Guess we gotta close it now. All right. I'm back. <laughs> uh, real life adventures. This did not this time. Okay. We're talking about the VPOs. They used to be associated with regions. Now, because of the reorganization, the board is geared towards a globalized world. So now all of them are involved in the globe. Consequence that each VPO's portfolio concerns a single global market segment. There's a VPO of energy, finance, healthcare, media, manufacturing, transportation, and resource extractions. A VPO serves as a shepherd and consociation of their associated financial sector. So basically, you're basically in charge of that kind of stuff. If you're the, you know, VPO of, of uh, healthcare, you're in charge of all the healthcare related stuff. <clears throat> so that inside the technocracy, the syndicate sees itself as the manager of it. And indeed, uh, the war effort in the Ascension War could not have been funded without their aid. Something that grinds the gear of many other technocrats. So basically, it's sort of like, hey, you guys, you know, you had this big Ascension War, you were fighting against that, which you know, has ended, but you know, you couldn't have done that without our money. And it's the syndicate who decides how much resources to give any project another convention shows them as the syndicate that controlled the union's temporal uh, temporal resources, their money, and prime energy quintessence through funding and investment decisions. So their amount of basically physical money 
and also magical power are both managed by them. So yeah, if you're in front of another convention, you need to go to them to basically be like, hey, can you make an investment in this? Can I get a little bit of investment? Please, sure, thank you. Ah, so let's talk about a big part of this. That is their methodologies, which there are five main methodologies. It doesn't mean that there's not all of them. We can talk about each of them. And I'll mention some of the companies that are under them too before we finish up. But for the methodologies, Unlike uh, like any multinational co uh, conglomerate, the syndicate is made up of organizations and fragments of organizations from many sources. Over the century, a number of minds have woven them together into one monolithic engine of economic control. While there are cracks and seams born from history, rivalry, ambition, the convention is, though, still unified by cultural of optimistic capitalism and individuality. That's the thing, is they are optimistic capitalists. They are... They are the antithesis of the greed of capitalism, which is such a strange position to be in for a big financing group, but a very interesting one, too. The syndicate values and rewards ingenuity, uh, innovation, and acute business and acute business acting, and is structured as a vast gladiatorial arena where victors win the spoil, losers are regulated to sidelines to plot their comebacks. This actually forestalls most infighting and bickering because successes are easily measured by the bottom line and universally celebrated throughout the methodologies. And unlike other conventions, transfers between methodologies of the syndicate are relatively common. So first we have disbursements, which is assessment division, reorganization division, procurement division, extraction division. This is the section of the syndicate that focuses on financing projects for the other conventions as well as the syndicate's own programs. They deal with correspondence mine with a dose of uh, primal unity. I'm not going to go into those different divisions, the assessment, reorganization, procurement, extraction, too much, but we'll talk about their culture a little bit. Disbursement funds are simply not, so not simply monetary. The money's a large part of the repertoire. It also includes rare minerals, exotic staff and equipment, real estate, premium, clones, access to primal essence. The market that uh, disbursements maintain has its own commodity translation to ensure that each object is traded fairly. Some see disbursements as a hidden hand that controls the entire union, but withhold by withholding funds or supporting studies in specific directions. Disbursement has been known to shape certain theories or technologies to their liking. They also keep excesses of some of the more radical technocrats under control. Uh, avoiding collateral damage whenever possible. And of course, this subdivision of assessment basically does that. They assess projects and stuff like that. Reorganization, the axe grinder. When a project has failed, it, they do kind of cut it off and stuff. That remove weak links. The torment uh, is the one that kind of gets together the goods for sending it to the other things. And extraction is it's harvesting prime evidence from nodes and responsible for security and distillation of those kind of things. So there you go. We know about disbursements. How about enforcers? They're also called the hollow men. They focus on making sure the masses respect the reality of money and pay their bills. They deal with forces in mind primarily. Their side, their lower divisions are legal, extra legal, extra, uh, extra national information and special information security. So basically enforcers work every side of the law and have agents among police as well as organized crime. It's done out of ideological as well as pragmatic reasons. Bloodshed and open violence are avoided whenever possible, but against reality difference, such reservations are not applicable. Also, the actual threat of violence is sometimes enough, though, so they tend to nudge the masses toward their position. The syndicate argues that the ideas of money only functions so long as the masses respect its reality. If debtors and defaulters would escape the system, money itself would become meaningless and human civilization would collapse. Enforcers exist to keep this idea in the heads of masses and thus hold the consensus. Enforcers are often the ones to bear the brunt of counterattacks against the syndicate. It is encouraged by the higher-ups uh, to have scapegoats for the case the scheme goes awry. So yeah, basically they're also the scapegoats. Uh, the legal division deals with the enforcement of the law to the advantage of the syndicate and union. Policemen, lawyers, judges, prison managers, extra legal, deals with the unworld of organized crime. 
it's kind of like simply referred to as the cartel, as they have agents in all major criminal organizations. Uh, in recent times, they've begun to lobby for their own methodology that would deal with the globalized nature of organized crime more efficiently. So extra legal division is trying to become their own methodology within the syndicate, just because of how big organized crime is in the way. And global. Extranational deals with transnational mercenary companies and private security firms that work at an international level. Um, the inspectors or the informational specialists are masters of inf our master infiltrators often used as for industrial espionage, but also would infiltrate chantries, scope out impending business mergers. They're put through harsh, merciless training as role are the elite, most elite of the methodology. And there's also a smaller one, the Special Information Security Division, which deals with just that. The financiers have three subdivisions under the acquisitions, uh, entrepreneurship, and liquidation. So they are focused on business trade and making money. They probably deal with entropy in mind. They've propagated the walled garden model described to their relation to the masses. They provide the environment for those who are gifted to prosper while making sure that the content is not harmful to the senses. Other sleepers see the success of their products to pass and try to emulate it by creating their own content. Instead of focusing on wrongs and enlightenment or other things traditions pre 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 preach, uh, they focus on success, and which is rewarded with money and turn even more attention. Only a few can win, but those that truly do are elite. And in contrary to some traditionalists, even among the tax technocracy, financiers do not own the global financial market. Instead, they act as consultants and position themselves as important junctions. So they attack people with, uh, attract people with lending advice and money and collect their debts with the aid of enforcers. They're deeply invested in the World Trade Organization, World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and similar organizations. They're very productive, uh, protective of them, and before the anomaly disrupted several of their influence, they worked to keep them mostly free of scrutiny. In the wake of protests following the Great Recession, the financiers secretly arranged for the creation of a domestic security alliance council basically a body of guerrilla defense and counterintelligence for major banks. Acquis acquisitions divisions focus on multiplying the profits for the convention. Uh, they see corporations and head funds with their own unenlightened members acting as a uh, basically go between groups for several projects. The entrepreneurial ship division focus on founding businesses that work for the interest of the syndicate. Um, and the liquidation division focus on extracting value from a business that's deemed no longer profitable. Media control, with its effects division, spin division, and marketing division. They focus on the use of film and other media to visually to create and reinforce reality with their spheres of mind and life. Despite various accusations, uh, media control is near, neither inherently liberal or conservative. Instead, they apply their trade to pure mechanics to profit that underlie every media. They know that despite posturing as the guardian of truth or the fourth estate, that medias are inherently destructive and competitive. With the main concern being pushing, publishing first and finding the right advertisers instead of messages. They realize that the old ways the designed in the 80s do no longer work. Instead of using glamour to showcase the rich, their yachts and parties, which only prove envy, they now focus on glamouring everyday jobs. Their goal is to cause the common man to make take extra ships, not because he needs to, because he wants to. The masses will direct anything that comes off as too commercial or corporate, but by normalizing the process through uh, flat hierarchies, crowdsourcing, and similar methods, jobs and leisure will eventually be used. So media control is really the kind of dark side of this entire thing here. So in these modern times, they nearly don't merely sit behind desks. Uh, during the Occupy movements, agents infiltrated the ranks and posed this dangerous anarchist, which then which was then reported to the news by the rest of the methodology to use uh, to discredit the entire method. The methodology has also taken up the fight against internet piracy, fearing that it, uh, that it, but basically fearing that it would allow the masses to see beyond the messages they originally encoded in their products. Media controls main strategies against enemies of the union. It's not firepower, but embarrassment. 
They take the hearts of their opponents' spiritual uh, beliefs and present them in a manner that will be ridiculed and discredited. Yeah, you know. So the effects division call themselves the makers of reality. They work in film, television, mass market function, music, video games, and even radio plays to install subliminal messages that will burn the ma masses of the technocrat paragram and cause them to reject anything superstitious. The marketing division focuses on selling the vision of the technocracy, making the people more comfortable than news conventions, and thus not normalizing what had previously been hypertech. Uh, this is done over the regular advertising channels, but also using selfie product placements or lifestyle promotion events. The spin division works to contextualize world news and manipulations and show the goals of technocracy as beneficial. It minimizes bad press, quashing stories about the limits of technology or short-sighted nature of international markets, assuring the viewing populace that everything will be just fine, while simultaneously blaming things or persons often associated with the traditions. So, uh, hey, we found our uh, really terrible group within <laughs> the syndicate. Uh, yeah, media control. And finally, one of the main divisions is the Special Projects Division of the Syndicate. Officially, it acted as a research and development program for the whole convention. In secretly, it cooperated with Pentex, a reality de deviant infested man uh, mega corporation. So, yes, Pentex, I haven't talked about, but it's a megacorp that uh, deals with, uh, they're working with worms and spirits and anti werewolves. So, Pentex is the anti werewolf corporation, and Special Projects Divisions are working with them. They focus on spheres of dimensional science and forces. The SPC's prime partner was Pentex. The methodology did not really care for the apocalyptic message of the worm. They regard it as a con to luring gullible sleepers, similar to how other large courts form. Neither did they limit themselves to Pentex. They also worked with traditionalists, nefandi, infernalists, vampires, and similar creatures. Most SPP members no longer follow technocratic paragram, in a strictest sense, instead using a jumbled version of wormish ideals and technomancy. Their procedures are often unsavory, with rumors of human experimentation being rec uh, having recently been confirmed, but technologies usually depend on veins, which are often used as power sources for various devices while still spreading spiritual sickness to the surroundings. In its prime, SPD had a uh, separate VPO with uh, five areas of special uh, specialization beneath them, weaponry, symbolic influence, research, investment control, in-house tech, and publishing. Entry into SPD was strictly regulated, uh, with prospective members being scrutinized as it would be compatible with the kind of work they were expected to do. Other members who discovered uh, their the connection to the Pentex were assassinated. So... Companies that they work under. I'll name a few. Azur, Gumba, a German's arm designer. Eris Designs, a marketing design firm. Iridium Medical, which directly serves wealthy clientele. Mercury, Log Mercury Logistics, which is information transport systems used by countries, uh, couriers and retailers. Uh, the Patent Assurance Executive Corporation, Hacks Corporation. Pentex, a merger of premium oil corporations syndicate, Proctor House in Boston in 1893. <clears throat> of course, most syndicate members are unaware of the horrible ties to power that Pentex has, you know. Uh, Pelix 6 provided source of code black boxes for data centers. Shenzhen, uh, Timing, a Chinese manufacturer of consumer industrial and military electronics, and the understanding of sort of UN of organized crime. So those are the companies. And that? I very strange about the is, of course, the syndicate. Uh, what am I trying to Turned off something. Oh, the, uh... I don't know what's so far down there. Anyway, uh, yes, that's the Syndicate for you. An interesting group, nonetheless. The fact is that, certainly speaking, some of the message the Syndicate tells on the surface sounds really nice. You know, it's that thing of, like, on the surface, they say, like, oh, you know, we want to present a world where anybody that wants to get ahead can, and they have the opportunities to succeed. But we know if they don't want to take those opportunities, it's fine. But then you start diving into the deep recesses of the syndicate, and you see the kind of dark control and manipulation that you have there, and the importance of the money, and there are certain sections which you just talk about. 
When we're talking about their methodologies, as soon as we hit the media control, we're hitting some very dark stuff. And some very corrupt stuff. When the enforcers, financiers, you can see it. How when they actually divide up and start doing their job, we can understand why the syndicate is as infamous as it is. Whether amongst, of course, the traditionalists or the members of the technocracy. They're an interesting group because they are very important to the technocracy. They are critical to the technocracy's continued existence. It would have fallen when the big things happened. The apocalyptic events before M20 occur. But at the end of, you know, at the end of the world of darkness in that version of it. The reality destruction, the, the problems that occur. Without them, the dimensional anomaly would have crushed the technology. And certainly speaking, they are still in big places and doing big things and dealing with finance and influence. And they are, as they say, they really are the glue that keeps the technocracy together. Whether for bad or worse, you can see that that's what they do. And uh, all of us out there that deal with the technocracy have to deal with it, whether you're in it or not. So, it's certainly an interesting place to be. But I think I'll leave that there. It's a pretty good place to leave things for now. Um, I hope you enjoy all of this, and hope you enjoy uh, learning about another group within the technocracy. As I said, it is one which is both dark and not dark. I, I, that's a very hard way of talking about it, because they certainly deal with a lot of, like, infamy. And to a good degree, they deserve that infamy. It's not always a given, but they do deserve some of the infamy they've earned. It's interesting to see that, yeah, they are in a weird, dark place that's kind of awful, but not awful, and, you know, we understand I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Interesting, and certainly one to keep in mind when we're talking about the technocracy of the both importance and a little bit of awfulness of it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed everything. I will, of course, do more tabletop related stuff, whether you're joining me live on, or on YouTube later on. Uh, you can always check me out on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. Fridays are normally my World of Darkness Day, but it's usually early to mid-afternoon, which I do these depending on my schedule. And Saturday's backup day, I do a live play of Pathfinder First Edition, a tabletop role-playing game, on Wednesdays at 9 p.m., that's what comes to theme, and a tabletop discussion show slash podcast on Saturdays at 6. You might want to check out discussing tabletop. Um, all right, everybody. I'm going to go. Oh, I have social media with Um... I'm going to go hang out with uh, Twitch a little bit more, but you guys on YouTube and, you know, anybody else that needs to get going, I bid all of you a deep and wonderful farewell.